The mission of the uh, Future of Humanity Institute is to bring excellent scholarship to bear on big picture questions for humanity. The underlying rationale here is that while academics do many different things and spend a lot of ingenuity and effort uh, on many different topics, some of the biggest and most important topics are relatively neglected, often left to journalists or retired physicists or other people who do them on the side for fun. And it seems worthwhile that at least some people somewhere should actually try to apply the same standards of, of scholarship and analysis that one would expect in any other academic field to some of these really big picture questions for humanity. So that's what we are trying to do. There are, of course, any number of issues that connect in some way to uh, the big picture for humanity. Perhaps the most important point of this slide uh, are the uh, three dots down here, which indicates that you could go on and creating many, many more slides like this. It, it's really sort of an unlimited scope for things one could dig into and study. So how do we do this? Well, we are a very small institute facing an indefinitely large and often intractable challenge. We are part of the James Martin School, in fact, one of the first batch of institutes that have been around for a couple of years now, and also of the uh, Faculty of Philosophy. We are multidisciplinary, both in the composition of different people we have, and also each individual person in many cases have uh, several strings to their bow. And we are unique. I think uh, probably in the world there is no other uh, academic research institute that is very similar to us. And also our work, as it happens, it turns out to be of, of intense interest to uh, the general public. So what do we do with this? We um, focus on the most important big picture questions. So this narrows down the scope a little bit. Uh, there are many things that are worthwhile and important, but only a subset of those are really important, could really make a difference to the long-term future of humanity, could really change the human condition in a fundamental way. We focus on ones that have been neglected as much as possible. So some important challenges for humanity, say global warming, obviously an important challenge, but there are many people around the world who are dedicating uh, their attention to that. And we try to pick up especially uh, those issues that for one reason or another uh, haven't received the attention that they deserve relative to their uh, significance, often multidisciplinary topics. And we try to select ones where we are able to find an analytic foothold. So there are many big questions, really great to have the answer to them, but we can't just think of any way to, to do any research or to find out the answer. So we sidestep those and, and pick the ones where we actually have some idea of you know, where you can say something uh, useful or do some uh, actual you know, serious work on it. So this kind of narrows down the field and then further the ones where we happen to have the right expertise in the institute or uh, where we can find, um, as we often do, collaborators either within Oxford or elsewhere in the world that, that we can work together with. And since we are very small, we're also seeking to, to uh, find some funding so we can grow. And as regards the uh, media interest, we are the public interest. We, we do communicate a lot with, with the media um, and with policymakers through various forums, directly with journalists. We're running a, a blog that uh, has had a lot of visitors and so forth. And we're trying to foster interest in the wider scientific community so that more people can begin to think about these kinds of questions in a, in a, in a serious, constructive way. Really trying to foster a new kind of rationality in terms of how we address the big picture questions for humanity. So we can divide up our programs into four broad areas. One is human enhancement. So why is this a big picture question? Well, there are a lot of things that we do in the world that changes aspects outside of us, but so long as human uh, and nature remains unchanged, the sort of the ground rules of the game are still confined within a certain limits. Now, if you could change some of the things about human nature, uh, that could potentially change a lot, both about our experience and about what we can do in the world. So, for example, cognitive enhancement. I think all the other technologies and all the scientific progress we have been made, we have made through uh, the ingenuity and dedication and attention and concentration and mental energy of different scientists. Uh, now, if you change that bottleneck, now potentially a lot of things downstream could change as a result. Similarly, other things like uh, life extension, emotional modifications, physical enhancements, these raise big ethical questions and practical questions. And um, addressing those is, is one of the things that we do. Particularly, we have been interested in cognitive enhancements, both in terms of biological cognitive enhancement, but also other ways that our epistemic capabilities can be extended, design new institutions to enable people to
collaborate better, uh, for example, or you can have IT technology, uh, methodological improvements, and so forth. The second broad area is global catastrophic risks. Find very loosely as, as kind of the upper end of the spectrum of things that could go wrong, things that could cause damage on a globally significant level. So a, a sort of a nuclear power plant exploding in one place would probably not count as a global catastrophic risk, but a repeat of the 1918 flu pandemic would count as a global catastrophic risk, or a nuclear war, or a, a lot of other things that, that really would at least make a blip if you had some sort of plot of, of the human condition over time. We, we just come out with this uh, edited volume here this summer, and we also had a big international conference on this. We brought together experts from different particular global catastrophic risk areas, perhaps for the first time, to actually address global catastrophic risks as a field. Why is this significant? Well, it turns out that some of these risks have causal mechanisms in common. For example, if you look at the threat from an asteroid impact or from a, a supervolcanic eruption, these being two of the modes that have caused past mass extinctions uh, in the geological record, they have something in common in that they both result in the ejection of enormous amounts of soot and aerosols into the atmosphere, which cause uh, climatic effects. Those same mechanisms would also operate uh, in the case of a large nuclear war, you have the nuclear winter scenario. Both of these have the same causal pathway, so it makes sense to study them and share insights between these different fields. Also, to, to be able to prioritize among different risks. You can't just study one risk, you've got to study them and then you can compare how serious they are. So we can dedicate our attention to the risks that are really most significant. And some countermeasures to some potential risk scenarios might actually increase other risk scenarios. So in order to figure out what would even be a worthwhile path to pursue, you've got to think about how other risks might be affected by one intervention. So say the development of more effective surveillance technology could help reduce certain risks, say from terrorism, if you know, law enforcement could monitor what is happening better with small cameras everywhere or cyber surveillance. Uh, it might also raise uh, the probability of certain other uh, risks, like of totalitarian regimes uh, arising and so forth. The uh, third broad era is um, rationality and wisdom. And um, broadly speaking, this is methodological challenges that arise when thinking about these kinds of big picture questions. And this is really important because the main thing that we're trying to do different is to apply a slightly higher level of uh, critical reflectiveness and uh, analytical rigor to, to thinking about these questions than is normally done. Uh, and, and it's very difficult for human beings to, to think carefully about these things. It's just the kind of thing that people tend to switch into a different mode uh, rather than the careful figure out what the evidence say, what we don't know, assign probabilities to some sort of more posturing mode where you have your ideological commitment and you're trying to stake out your territory and then push your view. And so trying to develop better methodological tools and techniques for thinking about these things is is, is a quite a big part of what we are doing. And finally, future technologies. And again, we don't try to get the panoramic views of all future technologies within the next 10 years or anything like that, but rather we might do a focus study on some particular hypothetical future technologies, which if and when they came about would have potentially revolutionary impacts on the human condition uh, and see if it's possible to uh, actually say something useful on those. We're just completing a, a, a major technical roadmap on, on whole brain emulation technology, kind of one approach to artificial intelligence where you, uh, in a sense, copy or reverse engineer parts of the human brain. So finally, future directions. For the next two or three years, we want to focus on sort of the core issue of the future of humanity, particularly the challenge of integration and of crucial considerations. There is always the fear if you come up with some big idea of which broad direction should humanity be heading, should we try to accelerate technology and scientific development, or should we slow down, or should we do more of this or the other, that you might have a lot of good reasons for what you think we should be doing, but you might have overlooked one consideration, which is such that if you took that into account, it might totally reverse the direction you think we should be headed in. Call such a thing a crucial consideration. And I believe that uh, most of us, perhaps all of us, have overlooked some crucial consideration, at least one, quite likely several. So in a sense, we are in this position of profound ignorance. We're sort of feeling our way around in the dark when it comes to these issues. So 
So to think more about the epistemology and rationality and how do you act wisely under such conditions, we are pretty sure that there is some really critical thing that you have just forgotten to think about or you haven't really realized the significance of. Um, some sub I will be perhaps uh, on the socioeconomic consequences of weak cognitive enhancers. So suppose you had like a pill that gave you two extra IQ points or something like that. If that was cheap and widely available, what would it do for the economy? Some stuff on the um, uh, future of artificial intelligence and a couple of other things here you can see. And we're also uh, preparing some major funding applications. And we might go into those areas if they happen to be successful. So I just want to thank James Martin for support uh, and a couple of other sources who have also contributed. Thanks.